I want to thank our media partner this afternoon, that's Veranda, and our showroom partner, um, Fabricut. And remember that after this presentation today, we're going to go upstairs to Suite 307, Fabricut showroom for a reception. Um, and I just... I'm going to do a little shameless plug here. We are honored. Benjamin is so awesome. We hope to have him do this one year, but we have two of our judges of our Southeast Designer and Architect of the Year Awards, um, Jean and John, on stage with us today. So y'all are in for a real mm -hmm. treat. Ben, we'll have you do that one day. Please. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, all right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Ellen Magali, who's the executive editor of Veranda. Thank you, Katie. Um, welcome, everyone to a discussion where we kind of go behind the design curtain. Um, it's a beautiful curtain, um, but it is the business of design. And I know that's where all of your bread and butter is. This is where you live every day, is the business of design. And talking about um, building a strong brand. Um, and we have some all-stars to do that. Before we get started, I want to thank ADAC. Once again, um, we had a very strong morning and just a lot of fun this morning, and so we have even more in store for you now. And all of that is thanks to Katie and Mackenzie and Cammie and the entire team at ADAC. We're so glad to be here and to be one of your partners. This is um, extraordinary for us every spring. And I also want to thank um, our panel sponsor, Fabricut, who are they, they're here, and we will also be there, um, as Katie said, afterwards. Um, that relationship is so organic because if you're, you know, reading, which I know you all do, reading our magazine all the time. I mean, let's, it, you know, they're always on the pages of it because all, you know, so many of the designers that we work with, that those are the brands that they go to, and so um, Vervain, Stroheim, all of the um, S. Harris. You know, all of their lines are on Veranda pages all the time, and so it's a great brand, and we're going to be there after the um, after this talk. So we're excited about that. Um, look for more inspiration there. So, um, okay, back to business here, but really fun and beautiful business. Um, we're going to be talking about how to build a strong design brand, um, whether you're building a design firm. As many of you I, I know are, that's what you're doing every day, stepping into an existing business or launching successful collections. Um, this is perhaps the most critical time for decisions as they, as you know, set in motion a whole series of um, decisions. So I kind of wanted to look at this as kind of like a carnival of best practices or even a confessions of mistakes. You know, <laughs> we can do, we can all learn from that too. Um, so what we did was we brought in the best in the business and that are all at this moment of a pivotal moment um, in doing something a little bit different, whether it's launching collections or kind of reframing an existing business or launching a new firm. So um, we're, as by way of introductions, I'm going to start with John Ike, who's over here all the way to, the, to my left. Um, John Ike built one of the leading architectural firms in the world after beginning at one of the most recognized, revered, because you started at Robert A.M. Stern. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Um, John is a founding partner of Ike Kligerman Barclay, which among its many awards was recognized with the ICAA's esteemed Stanford White Award, as well as being on the El Decor A-list, and their work has been published numerous times in Veranda. Um, last year, he embarked on a new chapter, a new firm, called Ike Baker Belton. John, after building one of the most, the most esteemed architectural firms in the world, you, st you broke away and started a new one. Tell us a little bit about that decision and perhaps a little bit about doing that, that you know, starting a firm in the 1980s and starting one now. Um, so we've been, uh, my partner Tom Kligerman and I had been together 34 years and Joel Barkley a good portion of that time. And um, I'd known Tom from graduate school. We both went to Columbia. Um, and then we were both kind of um, disciples of Bob Stern, and we ended up working there at a very pivotal time. Uh, started in the nineteen in, in 1980, when it was the architecture business was sort of in the dumps, but it was <laughs> on its way up big time. And so we started with houses, and then. Bob was an incredibly connected guy, and he was friends with Michael Eisner, and 
we ha ended up working with um, Disney and and Gerald Hines out of Houston, and um, and then institutional jobs as well. And I was there for eight years. When we when I started, there were probably four or five people there. When I left, wow. there were eighty. So it was a time wow. of phenomenal growth. And now it's like you know. 300 or something like yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> but it was a great training ground. Bob did not coddle. You were basically thrown into the deep end and sort of uh, made to fend for yourself. And so at a certain point, we realized that we, uh, a, friend of, a friend of mine, Alan Gerber, uh, we'd gone as far as we could there. And so Alan and I started a firm called Gerber and Ike. Uh, Alan, uh, unfortunately, uh, he, he lived the lifestyle, and he passed away two weeks into the, into the business, and so I was at a fork in the road, and Bob said, you can come back, or my clients encouraged me to go forward, and um, so I recruited Tom Kligerman, and uh, that was the beginning of it. Um, and honestly, we were totally naive, you know, had no idea about marketing, no idea about, um, you know, any way to sort of publicize. But we had established good relationships with um, Architectural Digest when we were at Stern's office, and they sort of took us as their pet <laughs> and, and kind of, um, you know, brought us along, and so it was, uh, that was a, a good thing and a bad thing because in those days, print was about the only thing going on, and um, so Paige Rents, who was the editor, sort of, unless you were a total superstar, you were kind of, uh, you know, given golden handcuffs, so you had to stay there and just kind of wait your turn, and but it worked, it worked out well. Um, and, and then things started to change after Paige left. And uh, at a certain point in the mid-teens, we hired uh, Commune to do branding for us. And they came up with a, you know, an interesting logo and web pages. And it was sort of the beginning of you know, getting sort of up to speed, and then uh, Instagram came along, and uh, Pinterest, and all these other things. And so we had, basically, we were big enough so that we had somebody in the firm to uh, manage those things, but we also had a great publicist. Um, and we'd gone through a number of not so great publicists, um, and then, we uh, found somebody who really worked hard for us. And so when Tom and I decided to split a couple of years ago, we basically um, asked Commune to do two different identities, um, figuring that would be a very equitable, fair way. And they did that. And we both continue to use the same PR firm. And it's quite amicable, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a leg up going forward. Yeah, and you know, you talk a good bit, and in, in through that through that story, PR was kind of central. We're going to get into that a good bit because I think what we've established is that that's kind of a, that that's a pivotal part of your branding and and exactly which direction you go in there. So um, so yes, okay. So welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> We're so happy you're here. This is um, now Jean Liu. Jean likewise is fam is a familiar and influential voice in the interior design world. She runs a Dallas-based firm specializing in high-end residential and commercial projects, with work and her wisdom gracing uh, the pages of all the big publications, including ours, um, House Beautiful, Town and Country, The Wall Street Journal. Um, but along with building this firm, she has stepped in as the CEO of Woodard, um, where she shepherds, grows, and leads this well-established outdoor furniture company. So, and this is um, 
Tell us a little bit about how that happened because you have your interior design firm and then you have an 150 year old, right? Yes. Furniture company. Um, and so now that you are um, directing. We have a family business and it really started out in the lighting business. Back in 2011, we acquired a publicly traded company called Craftmade, and Craftmade had gone out and acquired Woodard um, a few years prior to that. So part of the deal with the purchase of Craftmade was that um, Woodard came as part of this um, acquisition. I work with a bunch of gentlemen who um, are like father figures, and so they really wanted me involved, but they didn't really want me in their business day to day. Um, this goes back many years. And so during that time, I had gone on to pursue interior design, which is really what I loved doing. And um, when the Woodard piece of the acquisition was finalized, they came to me and they said, you know about furniture, right? Why don't you, why don't you take this on? I said, well, it's a little different. It's outdoor furniture. There's a manufacturing piece to it. Um, it's 150 years old. I'm really nervous about screwing it up. Um, but nonetheless, away we go. And um, it has been an incredible learning curve. Uh, many mistakes made along the way. I have all the scars to prove it. <laughs> um, but it's really, truly, at the end of the day, a privilege to still be part of what is the oldest furniture company, outdoor furniture company, left in the United States. And um, we have our challenges, and um, it is worth every bit of the obstacles when you get to meet these people and you see that their livelihood is um, embedded in the factory and turning out this furniture for generations to come. Yeah, and where, and, and remind us the location of? Um, we have a manufacturing facility that is based out of Owasso, Michigan. Yeah, so. yeah, and so, um, yeah, just very, it's, you've already established your interior design firm and then you, you're heading into this. We have so much to learn from you on that. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Benjamin Johnston, um, who I'm going to call Ben because we've talked about this. Yes, we right? We're okay? Everyone's, everyone can call you Ben. From his Houston-based firm, interior designer Benjamin Johnston has worked on projects in nine countries, 12 states, and 27 cities around the world. From residential projects in urban skyscrapers to boutiques in Beverly Hills, Ben has run a thriving business, but he's also very busy building collections. Um, specifically, he's got a rug collection with Madison Lilly, furniture with Chaddock, and a gorgeous textile and trim collection with S. Harris uh, that, draws on, that's, that draws on Italian culture and um, architecture, correct? <coughs> um, ben, you say those, that, you know, that part of, of your business, going after the, or, you know, building these collections or going after them, as you'll talk about, is grew out pretty organically. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, well, I, I will say that you know, for my background is also similar uh, that you know, I have my undergraduate degree in architecture, my master's degree in architecture, and I was really all gun ho to be an architect. The beauty of those kinds of programs is that they, it's such a well-rounded education that it, and gives you so many different technical skills that it really prepared me uh, to be able to uh, do kind of anything in the design world, I felt, or at least give yeah. me a foundation from which to work. Uh, so it was funny because I went and I worked for a um, uh, famous architect. Uh, I love calling them architects because I think it's so much fun. Um, <laughs> star architect named Cesar Pelli, and I worked in their Tokyo office. And it was probably my it was my first experience out of college, and I was doing. Um, they had me doing what we called in the office. Sounds like a dirty term, but it, we call them skin jobs. It was basically like looking at the skinning of a building and thinking about how we could like manipulate. So I was like dealing at this massive scale and trying to design from that perspective. And it was a fun, wonderful experience, but I became very hungry for some of those experiences that I had had in college, which was kind of at the very small scale. It was crafting with your hands. It was making things. Mm -hmm. It was it was building, uh, you know, things of uh, that you could actually tangibly touch. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't yeah. need a crane or an elevator to do it. Um, so, you know, it was through that experience that I actually came back to the States. I started my first design practice, and I really put out my shingle as a designer 
with no caveats. Like there was nothing filled in underneath it. And I had not really established a brand mm -hmm. uh, to understand what the business was or what, what I was doing. Or I just kind of said, you know, I'll, I'll design you anything. I'll do business cards. I'll do a website. I'll do, uh, you know, I'll build you some furniture. I'll do an art installation. And it was a really fun, great training ground for me as a young professional to kind of feel my way throughout that experience. Uh, and then organically, you know, I, I'm the kind of des designer that if I don't see something in the marketplace that I'm looking for, I, I'm like, well, I'll just have it built. I'll design it and I'll build it. Mm -hmm. We'll just do that. that That's the like architect in you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the kind of the evolution to bring, uh, you know, the furniture line, the rug line, and the fabric line to existence was really in response to so many different influences, and it does happened very organically. And yeah. so that was actually uh, kind of the, the, what I call my COVID babies. I'm sure many <laughs> of you had COVID babies. Maybe you were doing an herb garden or dabbling in hydroponics, or um, maybe you were, you were knitting. I don't know what you were doing, but for baking me- Baking bread. I, <laughs> you're baking bread? <laughs> I was eating bread, which is a problem. <laughs> Baking bread and drinking wine. <laughs> Lots of it. Uh, I was doing that as well. Uh, so. so, no, for me, it was, it was one of those times that I really early on, I thought, you know what, this is probably a good time, right? It's going to yeah. be, I'm going to have some time over the next few years until this whole thing settles down, then I can kind of dabble in doing the product design that I had wanted to do for, for a long time. I did not know what we as an industry were about to hit, um, which was just the most mad last <laughs> years. Um, but I had already put those wheels in motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so among everything else, um, I birthed those babies um, <laughs> over the last few, uh, you know, last year and a half. Um, but it was, it was a fun ride. I've learned so much and, and uh, about the furniture industry the fabric industry, it's been a real pleasure. I feel like I'm a better designer because of it. Yeah, and the thing, the babies that you birthed are still alive and thriving, as we see. <laughs> my herb garden is, <laughs> like it is just, I was putting it in, car, in the car to go like, visit my sister. I was like, all my herbs. I had the best smelling car in the world, but um, those are no longer, those, those are no longer, but you know. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about you know, what you must know and define about yourself as your, welcome, Ben. Oh. We didn't do this. <laughs> I started in with the herbs. It was the herbs. My family would have laughed Thank at that because they were very carried away about that. Um, I want to talk about what you must know about yourself and what you want to do and define first um, when you are starting a brand from scratch or, you know, going into a legacy business, starting a collection. Um, Jean, I'm going to start with you. What, what did you have to know and define about Woodard, you know, when you were going into it? What was the most important to you? Um, you know, being that Woodard had this very long history, um, I felt an incredible responsibility to take it back to what it was um, before it had changed hands a couple of times. Um, I felt that the previous owners had made certain moves that were maybe financially motivated, but they didn't necessarily align with what the brand's original DNA was. And so, and we're still working on this on this path, by the way, um, taking it back to its original heritage, being leaders of design, really being focused on quality, um, engaging in partnerships like the one we have with Alexa Hampton. Um, she too is very much um, a quintessential American design story, and I felt like from mm -hmm. a product standpoint, we had a lot in common. So we're doing things like that, trying to get back to the, the, our roots, if you will. Yeah. And um, by the way, this is not an overnight process, so. But, you know, going back to look forward is, yes. is what it sounds like, yeah, and just kind of Absolutely. being, you knowing a lot about their history and just, you know. And I think there's an element of overlaying a sense of modernity to this furniture. It's been around, like I said, over a century. How do we, how do we be relevant to um, a younger, newer generation of outdoor furniture consumers? How do we make sense to yeah. them? Yeah, yeah. How does so, this live, live yes. in today's world? Um, okay, Ben, you know, you're thinking of a textile collection. You, you know, you're, you, you begin talking to Sarah. What did you need to know about what you wanted to bring to the market? It's interesting because when you're developing collections kind of parallel with one another, it, there, was, there was this really romantic notion that I had that was, 
you know, if I'm doing this furniture line and I'm going to be showing it in a really big way, wouldn't it be lovely if I could express my way through fabrics and rugs at the same time? So I thought, okay, well, I'll just design not only this collection, but I'll also design these other two collections mm -hmm. and it'll just kind of organically happen. Um, and so with the fabrics, it was interesting because, and well, the, the fabrics informed the furniture, the furniture informed the fabrics, yeah. and, and they both informed the rugs. So uh, it was kind of a, a unique experience to be able to do that. One of the things that I found as inspiration for the fabric is, is you know, also again, my COVID babies, I talk about them a lot, but the, one of them was this, uh, re, well, almost all of them actually, were a result of this desire to travel and explore. It's the way mm -hmm. we all, so many of us get our inspiration. And for me, I found myself just with the most incredible wanderlust. I really wanted to go back to some of my favorite places in Italy. Um, and you know, what I love about the Italian culture is that it's so rich and varied between the different states that you can, you can visit. They have such incredible different terrains from coast to coast and up into the mountains. Uh, so I was really interested in exploring this kind of mental exercise of what it would feel like <coughs> to be in that, yeah. in that environment. So for me, I found, um, you know, also from the furniture standpoint, I was really interested and in kind of teasing out things that I was wanting to see, things that I wanted to explore. So I, I love neoclassical architecture. I love neoclassical design. I also love mid-century and mm -hmm. mid-century influences. And I really wanted to explore this nexus. And I kind of saw the Italian culture as, as being a great kind of font of inspiration for this, but how they all crossed over. And so I was interested in like looking at what I felt like were almost architectural forms yeah. in furniture, and then also looking at them in fabric as well. And yeah. so some of my famous, my favorite architects like Carlo Scarpa, uh, who I just thought was the most, one of the most talented people, was the source of inspiration for some of my furniture and my fabrics. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it was kind of neat to kind of tease that out and to um, kind of breathe both of them to life. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, you could go in all of these different directions, but you, you gave yourself a core here mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a, a point of view. Um, John, what did you challenge yourself to know and define about your new firm? You know, what, what did you have to, you know, as we go out into the market, what do we have to know about what we're going to do and how we're going to define ourselves? Um, it's just you know, sort of being honest and true to your personality. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I don't really look at Instagram or any social media. Um, and there goes my question about TikTok. <laughs> 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 but I have people who do. Yes. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's, it's really historically based, mm -hmm. but there's a wide range of histories um, from five years ago to, you know, 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really, you know, identifying what's appropriate for the, the particular situation. And it's often uh, a, a sort of a, a, a bunch of different influences. And then they're synthesized into something that becomes sort of totally unique. Mm -hmm. And then informed by modern technologies and, and um, uh, you know, basically modern development methods of drawing and things like that. And that's really the, the basis of it. Yeah, yeah, because you have three, the three of you had worked together for years, correct? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost as if, you know, you were, you were also defining the way you've already worked. A lot of that was kind of in place for you to kind of push forward. Yeah, with, right? and we would feed off each other. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, I think we all shared a love of history. We had a fantastic library. Mm, yeah. Um, and, you know, we would not open Instagram to look for a particular source. You'd actually go to books <laughs> yeah. and things Gassed. like that. Um, yeah. uh, we used to have a, a, a kind of a, a rule that they had to be dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we sort of gave up on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this, this next topic is just so, um, I think, I think we kind of came to some, some agreement here. Um, Ben, I'm going to start with you. What do you view as, as one of the most important early investments in your brand? I think photography is something we all agreed was like 
the thing that if, if you had one major investment to make, it would be in photography. And mm -hmm. I know that good photography can seem very inaccessible um, to a lot of people. I know that when I started my business, I shot almost all of my own projects. I bought the best camera that I had with the resources that I had, and I, I did all my own styling, and I did all my own post-production afterwards. I did my own website. I did everything, you know, to try to make that work. Um, and but I will say it's like an investment in just capturing the work that all of you are creating is like one of the best things that you need to be doing. It's our portfolio. It's what yeah. we, it's our calling card. Um, so I would say um, whether you're doing that or actually investing in a professional photographer, which if, if you don't have a skill in that area, hire for that skill. Don't try to do it yourself. Um, but I would say that that's probably the best investment any of us can make starting off. Yeah. John, your your big launch. You're you know you're you're separating. You're going. You know you're you're starting um, Ike Baker Velt. So, what's your early? You know what's what's your big investment there? Um, well, we were blessed with a you know a great catalog of work, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and you know I think that we tried to, to sort of you know I tried to use projects that were basically within my realm. Um, but, you know, we influenced each other so much, Joel and Tom, that sometimes it was hard to sort of determine yeah. what the kind of basis for a particular design, and we would kind of riff on each other's work. And so, you know, I, I have a book that's coming out next week or two weeks from now, and in it, um, I basically, it's called Nine Houses, Nine Stories, and each chapter is a house, and then it's, we investigate, you know, a relationship within that project. Like, for instance, one of them was a landscape architect and how we worked together. One of them was my former partner, Tom, and my former partner, Joel. Uh, Anita Sarsidi, who's mm -hmm. done a lot of uh, styling for us over yeah. the years about photography, and because most people, don't get to see these private homes, so their lens on it is through the photographs. And so it's incredibly important to sort of get that right. Yeah, so we're very excited about your book. It's May? May, yeah. Okay, we have to keep an eye on that. Um, Jean, you did something with photography, or you, you made a decision about photography in a different, slightly sure. bit of a pivot for Woodard. Um, you know, to echo what these gentlemen have already said, I do believe that even when you have a product line, photography can be um, the most valuable investment in trying to promote what you're doing. Um, with respect to Woodard, when, when I came on, I really looked at the images and I felt like they seemed um, out of date. As an interior designer, I would never specify an entire suite of outdoor furniture or indoor furniture for a client, and yet our photography still um, predominantly had all of the collection together, and I felt like it underestimated the uh, intellectual sophistication of a consumer or a dealer, and I thought, let's try and do better, higher resolution silhouette shots, show it in a lifestyle setting as opposed to, here's all the furniture, look at all the pieces it comes with. Um, this has been also a very, um, expensive, intensive undertaking. Um, trying to have the photography feel consistent from collection to collection. We have focused on trying to use the exact same photographer um, for several years now so that when you look at an entire website, it, it's all lit um, the same way. That again has um, been very important to mm -hmm. us. And, and this may not apply for many of you, but honestly our body of tooling, our library of tooling is very, um, expensive and a worthwhile investment. We've kept tooling for 50, 60 years wow. in some cases. So in, in a furniture standpoint, that would be like your library, yeah. your catalog of yeah. um, designs. Okay, yeah. And I thought that was really smart because it also allows you as an, an interior designer were able to look at it and say, they need to be able to envision their house, right. you know, their, their, um, their environment, they need to be able to put it in their environment, right? Yes, and we were showing too much of the landscape, so if you didn't have a coastal home, does this 
feel like it's not appropriate for you yeah. as opposed to shifting the focus to be more predominantly on the furniture and really letting landscape fall into the background. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, okay, moving along here. This, the time is going so quickly. I just got a little note. Um, let's talk public relations. John, we're going to start with you. We, what we, spoiler alert, we were, this, this was also something that everyone agreed on that it was pivotal, but there's also so many nuances of finding the right one, working for the right one. What does the measure of success look like when you're working with a PR firm? And I've gotten this question a lot. John, what do you think the most important consideration is with public relations? Um, basically, Hiring the right firm. somebody who understands your work. Mm -hmm. And we had had relationships with most of the print uh, editorial staff. And so really what we relied on was the second tier of, you know, um, blogs and, um, you know, a quote. And literally, I'm in touch with my PR people probably at least once a day, if not mm, more. Wow. And um, they do everything from sort of, a, you know, obviously contact different sources for exposure, but, you know, invitations for openings and really crafting an entire kind of package that facilitates our exposure to the world. Yeah, yeah. Gene, what's the most important thing we need to be thinking about with a good PR firm? I think um, for us, we really wanted to partner with somebody who um, we felt like was a good ambassador for our brand, whether that's from an interior design standpoint um, or the furniture down to, we might even like the same hobbies or have the same style and fashion or, I mean, they're really just good, um, a re good representation for you out in the world. And um, responsiveness, I think for us is mm -hmm. key. I've encouraged um, other people who are just starting out, if you've found the funds to hire a publicist, what I do is I try to sit down um, at the beginning of a year and go, okay, what should our goals be? Because I think sometimes PR can feel sort of loose. Um, how do we manage or how do we um, measure what, success looks like or what we want to accomplish that year. So I sit down with them and I go, hey, here's my wish list. You can tell me if I'm crazy. And then we really just try to chip away at what that list is every single year. Yeah, I think one of you called it a soft science, Yes. right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe black magic. Yes, <laughs> yes, so it is, it's, you know, I get this question a lot. How do we measure whether this is the right firm and whether they're do, you know, it's, it's having the effect that it, it's ought to, and it's a good investment. Ben, what's your? take on this. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that um, exactly what both what John and, and Jean said, that I think the other aspect of this that I think is um, one of the things that I think I've heard a lot of horror stories about hiring a publicist and that's not been a good fit and they haven't gotten you what you wanted and there was no metric by which to measure this. You've success. shelled out the yeah, money. Yeah, you've shelled out the money and they don't see a return. You know, unfortunately, it's an ungoverned body, just like the interior design industry. And we have a lot of people out there and in, in the design industry that you're like, man, y'all are look, making us look bad. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, the same thing goes for publicists. There are a lot of people out there that are not really doing a great job and don't really know what they're doing. So I would say um, kind of obviously checking to see that they un a, understand your industry, understand what you're trying to accomplish, that they have experience, that they know mm -hmm the players that are to be known um, is super, super important. And I would say if you're getting any sense that that's not, uh, the person is a bad alignment, I, I always say, you know, slow to hire, quick to fire. You, you mm -hmm. should be smart about uh, terminating that relationship and seeking somebody who would be a better fit. Yeah, I think there's really good points in there. It, industry specific, mm -hmm. they know the design industry and um, you know, the, I think reference, um, I think we talked about this a bit too, is getting a reference is always a good, um, from someone else in the industry, this person has worked great for me, that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> what is, um, in, in, in every business there's sort of hidden work, um, what is the hidden work of building a brand? Um, Jean, I'll start with you on this one. What are the things that nobody sees but that if you're starting, if you're, if you're starting out, you maybe need to know this? Um, I think for us, whether it's interior design or a product, 
we really tried to have all of our touch points be consistent. So if our website looks a certain way, we want all of our collateral to feel consistent. If we're really pushing a certain um, ethos for outdoor living, we want the customer service person answering the phone to mimic that same maybe um, mood. Getting all of those, getting everybody in line and in sync is um, a very arduous task. It never ends. I think the other thing we talked about on the call was there are hidden things like who's going to manage all of your accounting and your manufacturing software and your inventory controls. These are all really ugly, thankless, behind the scene jobs that is actually um, crucial to financial success if yeah. we want to stay in play, as we say. Yeah. Ben? I would say one of the hidden things for me is uh, that I could feel like I could share is that I don't think a lot of times um, we, as we are starting a brand, that we are, are kind of know what it is and know what the DNA is. Mm -hmm. And so, because we're kind of in it, and it's hard to sometimes step outside your work and say, you know, how could I market this? So for me, I know that several years ago, I actually sat down with kind of all of my files of all of my projects, and I w did an exercise where I went through every single image, and I wrote down adjectives that described mm -hmm. what I felt like my work had. And I went through, again, hundreds, hundreds of images. And then I started to say, okay, what were the words that I used multiple times mm -hmm. that I kind of came to the fore that I felt like were tangible for me? And then that list got smaller and smaller and smaller until I felt like I could distill it into three words. And I use it on all of our branding. It's classic, curated, and cool. I've even <laughs> trademarked the phrase. Mm -hmm. um, but mainly because what I wanted to be able to do is to say, what are all of our projects have in common? I want them to be able to say, this feels classic, this feels very curated, and this feels very cool, has a freshness factor that we felt like was appealing to our clientele. Um, and, and I think that if I had one word of advice for anybody who is starting out their practice, um, you can have a diverse body of work. You can have a lot of different design styles you're interested in. But try to find what that core essence is and be able to find a way that at least we use the three words, but find it as a way that you would be able to communicate that and your your kind of promise of, of brand yeah. to somebody else. Yeah. Because uh, ultimately, you're you're creating all this collateral. You're using a PR agent. You're doing all this stuff in, a, you know, in order to get work. Yeah, you're going to need to distinguish yourself, and so make sure you know how to do that, right? Exactly. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, John, hidden work? Um, I think, it, as is with everything, it comes down to communication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's basically how you treat your staff and your clients and your vendors, and that it has a kind of, that it really represents you know who you are and what you are as a firm um, and it just you know it, it's reinforcing the brand um, but in a more sort of subtle understated way yeah yeah it's the words that I'm thinking of are like ripple effect when you're communicating like that that's gonna have positive or negative you know it's gonna come back to you right um, I think I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question. Um, mistakes. Jean, can I start with you on sure. that one? <laughs> um, like I'll, early mistakes that you made that you just didn't. Yeah. Uh, two, one from the product side and one from the interior design side. I think the easy one that comes to mind is um, early on in my interior design career, I, I really didn't have any questions to ask of a PR firm. I just gave them money. And I didn't even know what I was supposed to ask. <laughs> and it was about a year in, and I went, I'm not sure how this is going. So I really encourage all of you, because um, it's hard-earned money, and I feel like there needs to be more conversation than, here you go, please put my name out there. Mm -hmm. um, on the furniture side, I think, along with inheriting a very old company, I inherited um, a group of very important people who didn't necessarily see my point of view when I came on. And um, I really wanted to turn a hard left, and we really was money not well spent when I realized they weren't ready to turn that hard left with me. So I think um, in whatever you're trying to do, it's important to get the people who support you and get their buy-in. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not beholden to them, but I really did feel like at the end of the day, there was value in trying to get them to see why this particular perspective 
made sense for the long term. So That's a great oh, someone once said this to me, you're not leading if no one's following. Mm. So yes, yes. I learned that great the hard point. way. Yeah. So. Um, anyone else? Early mistakes? Communication. Yeah, goes back to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it, it, where you screw up, you know, you can see it, you know, in the rear view mirror, but if you haven't spoken with your clients enough or your staff or any number of people that you work with, it's, that's the biggest, you know, I mean, it takes a lot of energy to, to do it, but it, ultimately it's worth it. Yeah. Anything, Ben? You don't have to have ever made a mistake. No, I've made so many. But <laughs> I, I do subscribe to the philosophy that it's not a mistake if, you, if you've learned something from it. And I, I guess every stepping stone that I've taken is, yeah. has helped me so much. And I've definitely kissed a lot of frogs that did not turn into princes and, you know, and invested a lot of time and energy and, and people that did not return that <coughs> investment. Yeah. And, and in, in those cases, I don't necessarily, again, think of it as a mistake. I just, it was a pivot point. It was an inflection point of like, okay, well, I'm going to go yeah. this direction. I'm yeah. going to go this direction. So I would say um, just being open to and saying yes to the right opportunities and saying no to the ones that don't feel right. Yeah. And, you know, that's a really great point that you make um, because as I sit here thinking now, I'm supposed to be moderating, but I'm like thinking about my mistakes and I'm just thinking the one, the worst ones were the ones that I learned the most from, you know, like I never did that again, ever, not even in a <laughs> soft way or anything like that. I just yeah. never did it again. Um, so the worse the mistake, the clearer the path. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think in this industry and, and a lot of the topics we've just talked about, you know, mentor, you know, having that kind of mentor or someone that you can talk to that's been there. And I think we're all, like, I feel very lucky to have sat here with you all because I've learned a lot from you. So that, I think there's um, that sort of mentoring aspect that we could all take with us, um, whether it's listening to folks who have been there, but and also finding someone in your community, too, that is um, been there, done that, and can offer some, some wise words, and we've heard a lot of them today. Um, time to open up for questions. Any questions, questions? Do we have any questions? Oh, we got a shy crowd today. <laughs> <laughs> One right okay. here. I've never asked a question before this morning, and I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my curiosity is up. Uh, John, I, the, the um, building, I, was, I think it might have been a residence, I don't know, it had a roof that basically was a wall as well, and it had um, like uh, lozenge-shaped shingles, or, or it was dark. It oh, did. okay, yeah. That one. <laughs> yeah. It's perfectly that timed. What's behind it and what um, it's for. Those are copper diamond-shaped shingles. It's the, the house is in Lake Tahoe and snow is a huge issue there. And so it's both dramatic because the roof comes down, you know, to within four feet of the ground, but it also is functional in terms of shedding the snow. And that's one of the main design issues there. But, you know, it has a great artistic side to it too with the patination of the copper shingles. It's, it's just beautiful. Yeah, that was a good catch. That was a good one. <laughs> really good. Um, right here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Just a reminder, we are recording. I know, but um, for sound quality, because reminder to everyone, we are recording all of our presentations, and they'll be on YouTube um, in a couple of weeks. If you didn't have the career you have now, what other career do you think you might have fallen into? Good. For me, it would have been uh, soundtracks for movie and film. Ooh, mm. that's a good one. You should write some of those for um, the the Instagram videos that yes. you know reels. Yeah. Write some of yeah. I think you can make some decent money that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just have to figure out the music part. Yeah. Um, gosh, I would say if I had an alternative career, um, gosh, I think I really, I think I really enjoy photography. I mm -hmm. think I would have probably really enjoyed that aspect of it. And the thing I really love about photography, which makes me wistful about it, is that you're capturing a moment of time and you can kind of put it down 
um, with interior design and architecture work that we're doing, I mean, these things span for years. <laughs> you just, I'm always jealous of uh, the photographer we use all the time. They come in, they get their work done, and then they leave. And I'm yes. like, wow, their project is done, and they can collect a check now. Yeah. Um, so I am wistful about that kind of immediate gratification of being done with something. Yeah, yeah. Jean? Um, I don't know <coughs> what I would do otherwise, but I can tell you the interior design and um, being associated with Woodard was not in the plans. So I <laughs> did go to school and I had a, a degree in foreign service and I really did feel like my career path was gonna be one where I was working um, at the Department of Justice, which I did have a job offer for, and um, now here I am. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, short order cook. <laughs> <laughs> Do breakfast and lunch, you're done. You sort of go home. What's your specialty? Grilled cheese? Yeah, all Pancakes. the classics. Yeah. All the classics. Yeah, yeah. John, we might, we might end up working at the same place, because I, I like the diner in the morning. Like, I want to be pouring coffee for people. Everyone's so happy in the morning. Let's yeah. be the same place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the good question. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, so I have a question about uh, marketing strategies. So at the beginning of your careers, you know, obviously there may have not been allocated funds for uh, PR and marketing just yet. So how did y'all go about navigating that aspect of bringing in clientele? Like what strategies without the did PR, you without the PR without, firm, right? Yeah, at the very beginning. Jean, do you want to go? Sure. Um, I actually didn't intend on pursuing interior design. I tell this story often, so I apologize if you've heard it. I had a friend who was going through a divorce, and she um, didn't have the money to redo her place, but she said to me, I just don't want any of this stuff anymore. It reminds me of him. Will you come help me? And I said, of course. I didn't want to take any money, and she said, you're not helping me unless I can pay you something. So I ended up helping her, and through her set of friends that I did not know at the time. By the time we were done with her place, I had two more jobs. So I think um, starting out and being willing to do something that where maybe there's no real upside on the money side um, can be beneficial. Um, I also think this is a little cheesy, but I'm surprised at how many times it's panned out. Um, we are pretty good friends with some of the top real estate agents in our city and the friendship existed before I had the interior design business, but the referrals that I've been able to get through her have actually turned out to be really um, great projects for us. So. Anyone else? You wanna go? <clears throat> uh, I, I would say for me, um, I think that, you know, luckily y'all are growing up in the day and age of Instagram. I mean, this is, unprecedented time, as, as John spoke to earlier, unless you had a relationship with a magazine and you were one of like the 10 designers that they featured every year, good luck. You were never gonna get published and you would never make a name for yourself. But um, you know, social media has really allowed um, designers to make a name for themselves in a very positive, I think a very positive way um, that has really changed the dynamics of our industry. And so I think uh, I can speak to that. I mean, I really, my career really took off when my social media took off, and um, and I feel very, I, I consider it to be absolutely integral. Uh, so I would say, I know it sounds cliche, but the social media has been at least beneficial for me, and I hope it is for, for all of you. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, had golden handcuffs, so I was lucky, but, um, <laughs> You know, I think about, I, I have friends whose 19-year-old uh, son has half a million followers on TikTok, you know, and has an incredible musical career. Mm -hmm. So, like Ben said, you know, it's the great equalizer. Yeah. If you've got something that's really great, it gets recognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned social media. What platforms do you use and you think are work the best for you? I'll I'll jump in for me Instagram for sure. I have um, I've been really enjoying. We're actually working through YouTube, um, so we've been creating a lot of digital shorts. Um, one thing that I can also just tell y'all that is 
I know it sounds exhausting to think about, but when you are having your photo, you know, your project photographed and all the styling is there and everything's looking fabulous, I mean, typically you don't want to cross your production crews, but if you have a uh, friend who does film production, um, you know, take the time the next day after the shoot, get into the house while all the styling is still there and film some videos. I mean, it's, it's, You've already invested all the time to do it once. You may as well invest a little bit more time to, to mm -hmm. get some video content. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, I would say that's been hugely pivotal. And of course, we, all, we use Pinterest as, a, as kind of an online library of products that we love. Um, well, we don't use that to acquire um, business. It's really done through the other channels. I think um, I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram. We all do. We um, do. So I, we post, yours is all hate. Um, we, we post, I probably have a different point of view. We post on Instagram in a way that if somebody's interested in talking to us, they can come to our page or our account and they can decide whether we're a good fit or just that we're, they're using it as a validity check. But I really do feel like the majority of our business is relationship based. And I think one of the interesting things is we have had calls from people who saw something on Instagram. How do you actually vet if they're a good client? I mean, that for me is still something um, that is a sort of fuzzy. I was just telling someone, a friend in the audience, sometimes in the interior design world, you don't know that you're not a good fit until you're, it's too late. <laughs> so. You have to speed date at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, and I also hear TikTok is an un, is um, still quite a good ground for growth if you are in the interior design world. John, what, what, what platforms did you decide to use with your new firm? Um, <laughs> it's, it, you know, all of them. Mm -hmm. And they all kind of support each other. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, as Ben and Jean mentioned, certain ones have different strengths. But I think that being on all of them definitely helps. Yeah. The other thing is, um, we are, are a lot of our photography. We are we're shooting videos now yeah. as well. You are. Yeah. yeah. And I think even the interiors photographers that we were working with are now either getting into film or they've hired someone on their crew that can come film. in and do the film right as the still photography is happening. Yeah. So that's been nice. Great. Yeah. Well, those questions were wonderful, by the way. So they completely just layered on um, a lot of the different topics that perhaps I was kind of like, I don't think we got to this. But then you got to it, so it was wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for being here, for lending your wisdom. Thank you. Can I make a shameless plug? You may. So, um, so if you'd like to see the new fabrics um, for the S. Harris line that I created um, that debuted at DecoOff and it actually got in one of the best new collections. Um, it is on view at the Fabrica showroom, which is where the reception will be afterwards. Great, so, great. You couldn't have said it better. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs>